about the topic of engaging our communities and society. I'm going to tell you a few other things you probably should know about me, just to know a bit of the perspective that I come from in bringing up this topic. I actually went to this church um, as a young person, high school and through my college years. Um, Mount Zion was one of the um, key organizations that supported me in actually achieving my undergraduate degree because of the academic scholarships that um, the church provided to young people who were a part of the ministry. Um, even more so than that, some of my first ministry experience came through what was then um, Ecom, which is now Urban Impact, because under the tutelage of Steve Burry and Harvey Drake, along with my godbrother, we started a t-shirt printing company doing some community development work in the Rainier Valley. And then I got to work with Pastor Allen and many other pastors in the room as, a, as part of some uh, church community development with leaders from all around the city. And so that was a lot of my formative years before um, going to, during the time that I was with World Vision, and then alongside of that doing youth work in my community and being a part of the pastoral team for my church, which was up by Kubota Gardens and down on the Rainier Valley. And so I feel like I have walked the streets of this city as a young person, as a young youth leader, as a community developer, as a part of a pastoral team, and as a mother um, to three young children, a son who is a sophomore at the University of Washington, a daughter who is 16 at Franklin High School, and a 10-year-old who is quite spunky, emotionally intelligent, and running the house who's off at camp this week. So that's the perspective that I'm bringing. And as I thought about the question Chris asked me, what are the things that we need to think about as we practically engage our community? I was consistently drawn back to a text that was the first Bible study I ever did on engaging the community, and it's the book of Nehemiah. Um, because the book of Nehemiah is, from my perspective, the best book you could ever look at to think about engaging your society. I will go so as far as say in the midst of this great host of pastors, community developers, and theologians, that you could not find a better case study in scripture of what it means to engage society. And so I want to draw some points from the book, but let me just say, um, I'm not going to draw them all. Um, my f first practical encouragement would be is if the book of Nehemiah is not your friend, make it your friend. I read the book of Nehemiah, I kid you not, probably once every couple of years, just stem the stern. You can get it on Audible if you don't have it, because you will find that there are lots of things to draw out. And so there will be points where I'm going to make a few points, but then I'm going to actually um, leave some for you to think about. And so I've entitled this Lessons from Nehemiah. But before I start, would you pray with me? Dear God of heaven. We release ourselves to you. We open our ears to you. We pray that the vessel, God, is equipped to do what you would have me to do, but that the words that are heard are the words that you place in each of our hearts and minds. That we would center and draw ourselves towards you to say, oh God, what might you have for me? Let everything that is not for each individual in this room fall away, but make bright like the sun, God, those things that you want to place in each of our hearts. Speak to us, God. Equip us, prepare us, transform us, call us to you, God. Let this not just be an act of the mind, but an act of the heart, an act of the will, an act of our entire selves, that we would see you and seek you and find you in this place, knowing that it is your word, God, that we must hear. It is your word that will transform. It is your word that sets our communities on fire, that brings transformation. All these things we pray in Jesus' name, amen. So I know Eugene laid a wonderful foundation for the kingdom. I want to add a cherry on the top of what was a fantastic Sunday that you all have absorbed by looking at just one passage of scripture. Because I think when it comes to engaging the community and the society, there's a place that we often start that I think Jesus says is the first thing you have to do is change your starting point. Um, so in Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, um, the scripture says, So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? 
He said to them, which I think this was probably a disappointing answer. It is not for you to know the time or dates the father has set by his own authority. Really? I want to know. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. I often find in lots of communities, and I today in my life deal with lots of millennials. It's like kind of been my thing as of late and the place where God has called me. And I often find in this conversation about engaging society, often the question we're asking is triumphalistic. When are we going to bring the kingdom? And if it's not you, just pray for the person next to you. Just don't look at them because sometimes it's not you. But oftentimes the question is, when are we going to bring God's kingdom? We believe it's on our back. We're carrying it into neighborhoods and we want to see it come. And it's a triumphalistic question. And I think the Holy Spirit always responds to that triumphalistic start with, sorry, baby, that's not where you begin. And what I like about what Jesus says here is the start for engaging society is in the place of witness. Jesus says, if you want to do anything for my kingdom, you better have a good witness. And if Nehemiah is about anything, it's about witness. And so we're going to talk about what Nehemiah's witness looked like. So for those of you who may not have been in the book really recently, I'm not judging and nor am I looking Let's talk a little bit about his context, because Nehemiah is a great example. And in my 25 years, again, I've never seen a better one. So here's his context. He's facing sin. He's facing economic crisis. He's got homelessness, food shortages, insecure borders. He's got a people who are oppressed and disenfranchised. The people around them are like, you're not like us. He's got racial tension and inequity. He's got people who are living basically like refugees, famine, high taxes, corrupt officials, priests, corrupt officials and priests, usury, people who are benefiting from the political and economic system for their own gain. He's got their, his own kind of political debate happening at the time. Sound familiar? <laughs> Isn't it funny how you like, I couldn't get a better thing on TV. This feels so relevant right now for what we're facing. I can't think of a neighborhood or a place that Nehemiah does not speak to. We can all relate. And while his context is different, what a city was then and what it is today, and while there are some uniquenesses, the issues are similar. Most importantly, the principles of witness are timeless and unchanging. So let's, I've got about 10 lessons from Nehemiah that I've got to drive by in the time that I've got, because at some point Nathan will be back at the back saying, you're done. And so I want to make 10 points. And as I make each of these points, one of the things that I want to talk about at the end of each of them are from my perspective, history and personal experience, things that I think enable us to live out these points of witness and things that disable. But at the end of each one, I'm going to say, and what are the things that you see that enable or disable you. Because this is not sort of a stump speech where I get to tell you what those things are. I get to invite your reflection on what enables me to be a witness in that way and what disables my witness. So the first one is Nehemiah asks questions. And I'm going to tell you now, you're going to hear a whole lot of scriptures in this drive-by, but you're going to have to read the book. You're going to have to read the book. Uh, Nehemiah cares enough to ask what is happening. It says, I question the Jewish remnant. When you, he starts the chapter, because this is a personal testimony told in first person narrative, he starts with a question. Um, the words of Nehemiah, son of Hekeliah, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. Here's the thing. A lot of us are humble enough to ask questions when we start, but we don't keep asking questions. An enabler of our practice is not assuming we know. Even if the question only brings confirmation, we should question our assumptions. And let me say something. To people who are coming from outside of a community, we will tell you all day long to question your assumptions. Let me tell you as a person who's inside my community, I have to question my assumptions. Don't assume because I live here I can speak for everybody. I cannot tell you the number of times where people have assumed because I'm black or because I live on Beacon 
I can speak for everybody. I have to ask questions too. And I have to keep asking questions. And I have to care enough to ask questions. And I have to know enough to ask the people who might have good answers. The things that enable this are humility, but the things that disable this practice are our God complexes. The sense that we have to know. A question that I ask often is, when was the last time you heard someone say, I don't know? How, how often do you hear the term, I don't know? It's like we're not allowed to say it, right? It is a presumptive part of our society that we are challenged as a culture to not put ourselves in a position of humility and receiving, to be willing to not know, and to be willing to tell others that we don't know. You've been in the community 20 years, you, you must know. Actually, I don't know that, right? Oh, you're coming to do this thing, you're leading us. You gathered and convened all the pastors, you must know. Actually, all God told me to do was bring you together. I don't know anything else after that. There is power in I don't know, and the power in I don't know leads us to ask better questions. Second lesson from Nehemiah, caring in action. It's one thing to say we care. It's another thing to actually care. The scripture says, I sat down and wept. Nehemiah confesses to the Lord for himself, his father, and the people. He confesses for Israel. He says, Lord, let your ears be attentive and your eyes be open to the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins the Israelites have committed, including myself and my father's family have committed against you. Caring in action. How many times have you been in conversation with somebody and they're like, I care. And you hear the words, but you don't feel anything else. We're taught to think about these things. But caring is a feeling actual word. How many times are you in conversations where you thought a lot about the people, but have you felt for the people? The words we hear in the book of Nehemiah are words of solidarity, coming into union with. Solidarity is not an act of the mind. Solidarity is an act of the self, of the entire being. He prays, he confesses, he's steadfast day and night, and there is real emotion. If you're having a lot of conversations about changing stuff and nobody's crying, nobody's sad, nobody's heartbroken, you should stop your meeting right there and pray until your change comes. Because in the book of Nehemiah, we see weeping, we see sadness, we see fear, and we see hope for the promise. Nehemiah is on a full throttle engagement with this community. He is not practicing in his mind. He is feeling with his entire person what he is trying to do. Point number three, oh, practice enablers and disablers. Seeing people versus responsibilities. Witness sometimes is seen as a responsibility. It's a to-do. I would encourage us to think of it as a full body engagement with other people. That gets us out of our head and into our heart. Asking the question of what does it mean to actually think about walking in these shoes, to see the humanity of the individuals and the people, the shared humanity that we have, then we can engage. Point number three, eyes to see. He sees himself and the people. So it's interesting that Nehemiah starts with his confession, not their confession. How many times does our witness start with, Oh, you need to recognize that you need the Lord. <laughs> I'm good. I'm holy. I'm saved. I'm here with Jesus. And if you just do this, all things will be good. Nehemiah starts with himself. Oftentimes, we can't see other people because we haven't seen us. I have not seen me. I have not done my own work. And so I'm trying to work out my stuff through you. I just believe... If we want to engage society, we need to, like doctors, take a Hippocratic oath to do no harm. And we do harm when we don't see ourselves. When we can't say, I confess we have sinned, including myself and my father's family. Every day that I engage, I walk with the notion of, Lord, I have sinned. 
myself and my people. I'm not here on a pedestal. I'm here with the people, amongst the people, in an equal position before you, with the people. But he also sees the people beyond what society says. How many people know there's a narrative that we're all being told about our neighborhood? Some of you can think of the narratives that you hear about the place that you live. Violent, right? Poor schools, bad neighborhoods, poor infrastructure. There's a narrative. Nehemiah doesn't see that. He says to the Lord, they are your servants and your people whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. He doesn't just see people in exile or sinners. He sees people that God loves and who are under his promise. How many times is our vision a little bit blurred by what we hear around us? How many times do we lose ourselves in the brand of the neighborhood, in the brand of the community? How many times do we spend our time fighting it? I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with people where they're talking about the rain and ballot, and I just want to get my black girl on. Wait a minute. I mean, I want to go to every stereotypical place you can go. I want to roll my eyes. I want to stomp my feet. I want to put my hands on a hip and go, that is not the brand of my neighborhood. But every time I go back to Nehemiah, what I recognize is Nehemiah embodied God's brand for the neighborhood. God's sense of who the neighborhood was. He's not spending his time trying to fight the people who don't get it. He's trying to live out the reality of what God has placed in his heart. And sometimes our energies are just spent in the wrong places, in the wrong conversations. Practice enablers, these right stances before God, creating the ability to see past the neighborhood brand, having a Jesus lens and not a socially constructed lens. Doesn't mean you don't know what that is. But it's a whole different thing to live out of a different place. And he takes the time to discern. I love the justice generation. I'm a part of it. But can I just say, go, go, go needs to be balanced by stop, stop, stop. Right? We need action and reflection. We need praxis. It says, when I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Has anybody been mourning? and praying and fasting before the God of heaven? God's not secondary to the math equation. It's a prime part of the things that we have to do. Witnessing is not a to do, it's a to whom. And that to whom is before God and with people. It's not a to do, it's a to whom. Before God and with people. Facing the powers, lesson number four. When we want to do stuff and change, sometimes there's all the things we want to able inside of community. But John Perkins said it a long time ago, if we want to see communities change, it takes people inside and people outside. And sometimes we're just all coming in and bringing everything we got into the people. But we're not bringing anything with us. We're just bringing us. Well, Nehemiah recognized that he had to face the powers of law. You may not have kings and governors that you need letters from. You've got kings and governors. You've got people who are responsible for your time. Governors that are about your resources. And I want to say how many times we show up in places and we haven't dealt with our kings and governors. Hey, I'm here to help you, but you actually have not figured out what you've got to give. Thanks for showing up, but... Can you be here every week for two hours to work with Jimmy or Bobby or to meet? Did you talk to your kings and governors? Did you get the resources that you might need to do what you've come here to do? Thank you for showing up, but the kings and governors are in your life and we show up in neighborhoods ill-equipped because we want to bring what they need and we haven't figured out what we need. That whole passage in Nehemiah where he says, but I was cut bare to the king.